Hello, Alice. Um, you can see that? Uh, yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, any questions, just uh, let me know as we go, otherwise ask at the end. I'm pretty casual about that. I might just minimise this one. Cool. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the current status and potential of tropical rock oyster aquaculture. Um, so yeah, as Deepak said, Sam Nowland and the Northern Territory Government Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade. So global rock oyster production in 2017 was 5.7 million tonnes. So that is about 6.8% of all aquaculture production and it's valued at about 6.8 billion US dollars. So the species here are temperate species dominated. So you can see in this table one, so this is the year, global yields and value of aquaculture from FAO statistics. And the two species that dominate culture are Crassostria gigas and Crassostria virginica. So these are both temperate species. So tropical species aren't even listed here and they make up around 1% of total global production. So tropical oysters are considered to be an underutilized aquaculture resource. So this is just a bit of background, pretty basic um, oyster life cycle here. So the, can you see my mouse there, Deepak? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so the oysters are broadcast faunas and the eggs and sperms are released into the water column uh, where fertilization takes place and the cells develop into a trochophore and then a free swimming larval stage and this larval stage will last about 14 to 21 days in the water column um, before they settle down, they grow a foot and they settle down and crawl on a surface as fat um, and they develop into a juvenile and they're sedentary and it takes about one to three years before they then mature um, to adults. So this on the right hand side is some development pictures of tropical rock oyster. So A here is the egg. Uh, B is fertilised, it's got a little polar body there, and then C, D, the egg's developing. Uh, K is a trochophore and L is the first stage, that's about 16 hours post-hatch, it's a D stage larvae. Uh, and down the bottom here, this is the larval stages, this is the tropical black lip, so from a D stage, um, growing all the way until spat at about 21 days of age. So this spat is the first juvenile stage. And this is a bit about the oyster farming uh, cycle. So you spat production, it can either be in the hatchery, so you're getting brood stock and then breeding them, embryos, larvae and then spat. You can grow those spat up to become your next generation brood stock or you can use those spat and they can be deployed to a farm or a nursery system. There's a few types, you can have a nursery system uh, inside a facility, a hatchery. This is a downweller system here, um, or you can have like a floating basket, like an ocean-based nursery system. And then from there you go to grow out. So this is your bigger animals. There's a lot of ways to grow them out. Tray culture, uh, hanging rope culture and basket. And then after about one to three years, depending on the species and grow out methods, um, you go to market. So harvesting, transporting, processing are all part of that. Um, and you can also, if you don't produce hatchery uh, spat, you can collect wild spat. So a lot of the industry um, is reliant on wild spat. So this, this the consistent supply of spat is really key for farmers. Uh, they need spat to be able to grow oysters for their farms, basically. So when we talk about tropical oyster aquaculture, we're talking about uh, this space here on the globe between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. So that's where we, that's the area of the world that we're talking about. And basically aquaculture of oysters in this area was born from the decline of wild oyster stocks as a result of overfishing. It's pretty common for aquaculture to occur that way uh, with a lot of other species and in and temperate industry as well. The reason why tropical oysters are attractive aquaculture candidates is because they have rapid growth rates. So they compared to the temperate oyster industry, they grow really quickly. Some, some species can reach market size within one year. Um, the technology is quite simple. You have relatively small financial input uh, and there's no feed cost because the oysters are feeding on microalgae that's natural in the water column. 
and there's already uh, established processing and marketing channels. And that's because there was already a wild harvest fishery, so they can directly tap into that, those channels. So the current industry, strat industry status in the tropics. So unlike the temperate industry, which you saw was dominated by those two species or just a few major species, in the tropics there are many countries and they culture a variety of species. So this table two here just gives a bit of a summary of that. So for large scale commercial productions, that's more than 10,000, um, 10,000 tonne a year. There's seven countries involved in that scale of farming and 13 species. Uh, for small scale commercial, so more than 100 tonne per annum. Nine countries and 16 species. And then for experimental and subsistence culture, the 21 countries and 17 species. So it's very different. Uh, make up to the temperate industry. And it's also generally comprised of many family based farms and they provide important subsistence and economic activities in developing regions. And this photo here is um, a lady that's an oyster farmer in Malaysia. And you can see even at her farm, she's got two species here. She's got a white scar and a black scar tropical oyster. So just on the one farm, she's farming two species. So I guess the big question is if it's a uh, Potential industry, why is it currently underdeveloped? Uh, a few reasons. So developing nations, the economies of most tropical countries are still developing. So there's only five tropical countries. Um, these are Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand that rank among the 51 countries classified as high income by the World Bank. So that's very few high income countries in the tropics. So an outcome of the low socioeconomic status is really a research and development deficit. So a lack of research and development on tropical species in these regions. We also have quite underdeveloped production methods. So the grow up farming systems are often rudimentary. And you can see here, they're not, they're not single seed. So when you have a single seed oyster, it's one oyster and that's um, what a lot of Western countries like to eat on their plates. They get a plate of oysters, a dozen single seed oysters. You can see here in Vietnam, they're farming oysters all clumped together, which is how they grow naturally. Um, and that's, that's a kind of a rudimentary system too. This is even more of a uh, advanced system where they're all single seed in baskets. Almost all spat are obtained from the wild. So they're collecting their seed stock or their juveniles from the wild, which is really inconsistent and unreliable. Uh, it makes it very difficult for farmers to predict their production and to have a consistent supply for markets. So hatchery production is definitely preferred because you can guarantee your reliable supply of spat. And then you can also start looking at selective breeding programs. Um, but currently that's underdeveloped in the tropics. Very few tropical species are produced in the hatchery. But this also requires an investment in research and development. Another reason why it's underdeveloped is the taxonomic confusion. So most tropical oysters remain, taxonomy remains unresolved and it's a really big constraint for industry growth because if you're working in one country and you're working on species that you call something and then I'm working in another country and I call the same species a different name, then we don't know that we're working on the same species and we can't move forward together or share information readily. So this is just an example here, Socostria mitoloides versus Socostria echinata. This is the oyster that we work with in the Northern Territory. It's a black lip rock oyster, and there's a broodstock here. So on the World Registry of Marine Species, it's known as Socostria echinata, um, but echinata means spines, and it probably is describing this small oyster here with spines. Can't really see the spines that well in the photo, but this oyster's got spines growing up of it. So originally this was thought to be a juvenile of echinata, of these large oysters, and that when it got bigger, it lost its spines but this is actually a different species of oyster. So the proper name is likely to be Socostria mitoloides, um, but the taxonomy hasn't been confirmed or validated or reviewed. And so we're still calling this species Echinata, even though we know that name's incorrect. And that's just one example. So without be having a clear understanding of the species, it's really difficult to adapt culture methods for other species or closely related species, and also to develop new methods. So shellfish safety is also another uh, constraint. 
because oysters are usually eaten raw. So you need to be really careful of ingesting things like toxic microalgae, uh, pathogens like E. coli and heavy metal accumulation as well. Heavy metals accumulate in oysters because they're filter feeders. Um, so basically in the tropics, consumer perception is of shellfish hygiene and safety is really poor. And it's something that tropical countries need to work on. They need to work on having good shellfish safety protocols uh, and building their reputation, the industry reputation. And that's also very difficult when it is made up of a lot of developing economies that might not have the resources to invest in good shellfish safety protocols um, and monitoring. So some ways the industry have gotten around this, they've created an industry based on cooked oysters. So in Vietnam, a lot of the oysters are cooked and as well in Malaysia. In Malaysia, the oysters are found in a pancake. Um, so they're cooked, which means that you get, you get away from um, having a lot of problems with toxic algae and E. coli, which predominantly issues in raw product. There's an oyster, a cooked oyster there. So drivers for development. What's driving the development of tropical oyster aquaculture? So in the tropics, we experience rapid population growth and economic growth. And by 2050, the tropics will host most of the global population and two thirds of its children. And this oysters provide us an alternative livelihood opportunity and subsistence opportunity. Um, and they can provide economic benefits in some of the world's poorest regions. So there's a, also a growing interest in native species. species. So not, not importing um, introduced species by farming native. Uh, and just an example in Australia, we have um, imported the Pacific oyster into southern parts of the country, but um, it's no longer appropriate to move that native, move that introduced species around. We're really more fo more focused on developing our native species. There's also good opportunity for niche markets and unique flavors. So just bring it back to Australia and the opportunity in the tropics here. Currently, Australia doesn't have a tropical rock oyster industry, but it's something that they're interested in developing. Um, so we have pilot farms growing in small quantities of oysters. So in the Northern Territory, there's a few islands. South Goulburn Island, Tiwi Island and Groot Elliot. So this is the Northern Territory up here. Uh, in Queensland, which is over here, there's a farm in Bowen. And in WA, there's a farm in Pilbara and Carnarvon. And these are pilot farms. They're growing two species. So the black lip oyster that I spoke about earlier uh, and the species here, is a milky oyster and the taxonomy is confused as well with both those species. Some of the research in the Northern Territory. So traditional owners, which are the Aboriginal population in the Northern Territory, they really want to reintroduce commercial sales experience in the past by developing an aquaculture industry. So like I said, they had, they had a wild harvest industry uh, and a lot of that got overfished and now they're interested in farming oysters. They see that as a development opportunity that really aligns with their aspirations of working on their country and using their natural resources. And that's a photo there from the Goulburn Island oyster farm. So this is the Darwin Aquaculture Center. Uh, this is where myself and, and Deepak work. It's a multi-species hatchery. It's on an island in Darwin. Um, we farm a variety of, we have a hatchery there for a variety of different species. Uh, so rock oysters, barramundi, chew fish, pearl oysters, sea cucumbers, and giant clams. Uh, so why do we choose black lip oysters to focus on? Basically, a few reasons. They have been historically harvested by communities, and there's local knowledge of the species, so they know where to collect broodstock from, and broodstock are those parent stock that we really need to breed from in the hatchery. They're really large oyster species. They can grow up to the palm of your hand and some, some areas they grow to a dinner plate size. And so that shows promising growth rates, which is really important for aquaculture because the faster you can grow your product and get it out, then the more return on investment you'll have. They're found across the Northern Territory. So it's something that a lot of different communities could get involved in. And most importantly, they taste really good. And they look beautiful too. There's a photo there. So a bit of background, the Darwin Aquaculture Centre started hatchery trials in 2010. Really limited knowledge on this species. 
previous to this, there was two published papers. Um, so you can see them here, Southgate and Lee, 98, and Crayoli et al, 84. Uh, our spat production was really inconsistent and, and not at commercial quantities, so less than 30,000 spat. And our settlement percentages, so from Petty Village, so that's that larvae here that has a foot, uh, to spat, which is the juvenile stage, were really low. We had about 2.25% settlement, which is not commercial. Uh, these are larger spots. So the NTG Tropical Rock Oyster Aboriginal Economic Development Program uh, was dedicated program in 2014. Uh, Sam? Yeah. So alone, I will just uh, try to... Uh, Sam, can you unmute yourself? Yep, there we go. Okay. Oh. Oh, I think it's going off again. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. All sorted. Okay, great. Um, so, in 2014, the dedicated research and development project, so it had four major objectives, hatchery production, grow out production, uh, shellfish quality assurance and business development. So this was research funding put towards tropical rock oyster aquaculture development. Um, and basically, I'm just gonna, not gonna go through everything, but I'll give you an idea of what the project looked like. I'll just talk a little bit about the hatchery production goals. Um, so the research and development aims here were to further develop and optimise hatchery culture techniques for the blacklit rock oysters to permit the development of aquaculture in the NT. So we had four specific aims. We wanted to map the reproductive seasonality of natural oysters. We wanted to record and describe the details of larval development and optimise spawning induction techniques. So that's getting them to breed in the hatchery and then optimise their tank conditions for rearing. So looking at how hot they like the water, the larvae, or how salty, or how much microalgae, how much food they like, and how much stocking density, like what stocking density they like to be kept at. Uh, and just to give you an idea of some of the research that we did here, I'll just talk a bit about the number one point there in the temperature and salinity study. So mapping reproductive seasonality, the aim here was to look at seasonal fluctuations in the reproductive cycle of black oysters from three different locations across Northern Territory uh, to and to look at different exogenous factors. So basically temperature and rainfall and their effect or influence on gonad development. So these are the sites here. This is Australia and we're looking at the top of Australia. Um, Melville Island was one site, Goulburn Island and Moorunga Island. These are all different communities. And the method that we used here was histology. Uh, so basically what you're looking at on the right is a, on the top is a male um, gonad. So on the left is really underdeveloped sperm in the follicles. And on the right, it's quite developed sperm. So this is really good reproductive condition. And down the bottom, these are eggs. So each unit is an egg in the follicle here. So this is quite low development and this is quite high. So every four to six weeks, we got samples sent in from these locations. And then we looked at them uh, histologically and we graded their gonad to see how reproductively mature or not they were. And we did this over a year and a half. So come some of the key results. We've got a gonad index here. So the higher the index, the better the reproductive condition. And the lower the index, the poorer. So basically you can see that they've got high reproductive condition in our wet season, our monsoon season. And they go, get quite a low reproductive condition in our dry season. And this is a year and a half here. Um, so it's very clear wet and dry seasonality for breeding. So they're breeding at this time and they're not breeding at this time. They, and this is also correlated with environmental cues. So rainfall and temperature. So when it got hotter in our wet season and more rain, that's when they breed. And when it gets cooler in our dry season, they go into like a regressive stage. Uh, we also found that the occurrence of hermaphrodites was really low. So only 2% of tropical black oysters were hermaphrodites. And the sex ratio was one female to every 1.4 males. It's really important basic information that you need when you're, just, when you're developing a breeding program for a new species. 
So the other study I'll just quickly briefly go over uh, was looking at temperature and salinity and the effect on the growth and survival of the larvae. So this experimental design, we had six temperatures and these are temperature water baths here. Uh, we had four replicates and nine salinity. So each of these containers inside the, temp oh, the water bath is a uh, different salinity and the larvae are cultured in these um, different salinities in these containers. We looked at each major stage. So we looked at embryo, uh, D stage larvae, which is the first stage, umbinate, and then eyed larvae, which is the last stage. And the temperatures that we looked at range from 17 degrees, so quite cold for us here, to 32 degrees. And our salinity was 11 parts per thousand to 36 parts per thousand. Uh, 36 parts is full tank water. Cool. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, so the key results here of this study, basically water temperature and salinity did have a significant effect on development. Um, so you can see we've got some recommendations for the rearing temperature and salinity for the four different stages. Uh, so salinity was a lot lower. Uh, for most of the stages, lower salinity produced better larvae. Uh, the larvae are quite robust, so even though survival could be high, um, the growth was the best way to look at differences and how happy they were between treatments. And um, the way we measured growth was the dorsal ventral measurement, so from the hinge of the larvae uh, to the widest part. And so our recommendations for the hatchery were to change salinity to maximise larval growth. Um, so basically, what does this actually all mean for farmers? Um, so this this uh, graph here shows some different larval runs. So the age of the larvae, so from zero days old to 21 days, which is that settlement, and their mean larval APM, which is their growth, basically. So down here, these runs were previously what we would get before we optimised or did any experiments to look at optimising uh, larval rearing. And then these two larval runs, four and five, were the kind of growth curves that we were getting after we optimised the larval rearing. So we had a um, percentage settlement increase, so from the petty village of larvae to spat from 0.49% to 10%. And we were able to produce hundreds of thousands of spat instead of tens of thousands. And settlement occurred earlier, so it occurred three days earlier than we would normally see, at about 18 days post-hatch, and it was spontaneous. So the larvae were doing a lot better, and they were happier. Uh, and basically, it means more spat for farmers. So it's really important to do that, go back and do those trials, to look at optimising um, your conditions for your new species. It really can pay off. So I'll just talk a little bit about growing out. So what happens to the spat when they leave the hatchery in Darwin? So this is a trial that was done on Goulburn Island. It's an indigenous community off the coast of Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory. So we trialled three sites here, Fletcher's, Malpark and Wigu. We looked at growth and survival of the oysters and we looked at water quality. Um, so this grow out systems, we started with a post and rail system, pretty rudimentary and not very stable in cyclones and we do have a lot of cyclones so that didn't last very long. Um, the floating basket system was next, so this is the photo here in the middle, um, but you needed a boat to get out there and a boat's not always operational. So the system that worked out to be the best for this community was the intertidal long lines. This is a photo here on the right. So at low tide, you can walk out and collect your baskets. It also means that every low tide, the sun will hit the baskets and kill any fouling, uh, which greatly reduces the amount of times that you need to go and clean and grade your oysters. So looking at growth and survival, Preliminary trials show that it's about 18 months to market size, and the market size we're talking about is 70 millimetres. So that's a, a typical bistro oyster in Australia, um, which is really good. At, that's a good growth rate, and that is comparable to the temperate oyster industry. And there's very high chance that we can improve that growth rate uh, if we work on it more with trials and different grow-out methods. So our current project, so this work um, was quite successful and it basically led into um, that this current work that we're doing. So it's a collaboration with the Northern Territory Government with the Cooperative Research Centre for Developing Northern Australia, working with Yagbani Aboriginal Corporation uh, and Diliapa Land Council, which is another Indigenous group, 
and Western Australia to continue looking at research and development to develop the tropical oyster industry in Northern Australia. Just a little bit about the work that we're doing at the moment in Darwin. So we're looking at securing and consistent spat supply, so juveniles for farmers. So we're looking more into conditioning the broodstock, so getting the broodstock into a really good reproductive condition outside of that normal wet season spawning. We're looking at settlement trials, so increasing our set rates from 10%, which is what we get now, to about 30%, which is what would we what we would consider commercially viable. And nursery trials, like how, how can we get them out to the farm quicker? Uh, we're looking at grout methods. So the photos here show uh, the farm being installed on Groot Elliot and other island communities. This is an oyster farm line being installed there. And this is two locations we're looking at grout. So Goulburn Island, which the photos previously, and Groot, which are the photos here. Uh, looking at different basket brands or like farming brands, Hexel and Sepa. Uh, and looking at um, stocking density and tide height. So you can see there's two lines on this, two heights on this line here. So alternating the height with different seasons and gear type. So having a float on the basket, whether that creates a better shaped oyster compared to no float. We're also looking at biosecurity. It's really important in the early stages of development to make sure that you look at biosecurity and any potential risks. Um, and looking at common names, so getting the, the names for the oyster sorted out and the community extension and um, communication. And just a little bit about our extension practices. So this partnership was initiated by traditional owners, so by owners of the land. And it's something that we're helping, helping them with. So it wasn't something, an idea that we had and we went out and Said, this is a great idea, you should be doing this. It really came from, from them wanting to start aquaculture of this oyster species. We work together, so we share our knowledge and we learn from each other. We don't go in uh, knowing everything. We definitely learn a lot and it's two-way education. We have research partnerships with universities. So Charles Darwin University, which is local, uh, James Cook, and also the Southern New South Wales um, government we have been working on temperate oysters for many, many years. And we learned from others. So the middle photo here, we were in Malaysia, went to Malaysia and spoke to a tropical oyster farmer there. So really learning internationally as well and communicating between and within communities and project partners. So not just us communicating outwards, but everybody communicating with each other. And the photos on the right and left here are from the communities that we were, that we're oyster farming in. Some of the challenges, so it's pretty remote. It's a long flight to go anywhere. Um, there's big seasonal tides, which means that in some times of the year we have to work at night time. So it's a photo of us working at night time because we want the tide to be really low because there are also crocodiles, which is this middle photo. So we're not getting in the water. We're waiting for the tide to go out before we work. We have to work quickly and effectively and be out of that area before the tide comes back in. We also have box jellyfish and cyclones. Um, so yeah, the middle photo is a crocodile and this is a crocodile's teeth in a basket float. Also aquaculture requires specialized knowledge and there's a lot of pressures at community life as well. And COVID-19 has been a challenge. We haven't been able to travel out to communities for many months now, so they've had to do a lot of stuff on their own, which is um, good, but it's also very challenging as well for the project. And the future vision here, so traditional owners, they aspire to develop rock oyster industry that will supply the premium, unique and delicious oyster to the Australian market. So this, this is Bunug Galaminda here, and he says that oysters are their gold mine. If you were interested in this topic and you'd like to read further, there's some things you can have a look at. And let's just say thank you to all the partners for their support and participation. <laughs>